welcome to Modern Anarchy, the podcast featuring real conversations with conscious objectors to the status quo. I'm your host, Nicole. On today's episode, we have a researcher and professor, Alan McKee, join us for a conversation all about the effects of pornography after 50 years of academic research. Together, we talk about the contradictory data about pornography use, informed consent, and lifelong sexual learning. Y'all, this episode is so good. There is so much here to learn about the importance of taking a critical eye to research about pornography and some of the social scripts that are at play here with defining what is good sex, what is consent. There's just so much here to learn that share this episode with a friend, dive in, check out the resources below. I've got, thanks to Alan, some great porn resources below for ethical and feminist queer porn. So if you've been looking for resources, I have them linked below. Y'all, this is a great episode. I hope you learn as much as I did and enjoy this conversation with Alan. Tune in. So So, Nicole, hello. What can I tell you? What can I tell you? I like this taking direction ready from the start. Hmm. First, you can tell me who you are, and you can take that in any direction, shape you want to. Hello, my name is Alan McKee. I'm a professor Mm -hmm. in digital and social media at the University of Technology, Sydney. I'm a queer man. I have been researching pornography for literally decades my first Mm. piece on pornography was published in i think 1996 and i've just completed a three-year project with a team of people funded by the australian research council and we've just published a book or we're we're proofreading the the book right now coming out of that and it's called what do we know about the effects of pornography after 50 years of academic research okay can i ask what do we know Uh, Less than we should. What we have found is that although academics have been researching the effects of pornography since 1971, pretty much in Mm -hmm. in the modern form, and there have been literally tens of thousands of projects and articles written, if you go in trying to find some of the basic stuff, like, for example, do people who consume pornography know more about how to have sex? Mm -hmm. We don't know the answer. Uh, Do people who consume pornography have more pleasurable sex? We don't know the answer. And that's because the vast majority of the research that has been conducted has been, I would say, going off on tangents. Like, for example, there's an awful lot of research on what is the correlation between how much pornography people consume and whether they have stable long-term monogamous marriages, which is... um, If you're interested in sexual health, that's an irrelevant question because... You can be in a stable long-term or no-west marriage and have a shitty sex life. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, you can have a marvelous sex life without being in a monogamous long-term committed marriage. Absolutely, yeah. Or or a lot of research about um, is there any correlation between people consuming pornography and being more um, open to kinky sex, Mm -hmm. Um, particularly rough sex, for example, um, which is presented as a bad thing to be avoided. And again, that's irrelevant if you're interested in sexual health because Mm -hmm. uh, whether your sex life is consensual and informed and happy and healthy has no correlation with whether it's vanilla or whether it's bdsm so the answer to the question is we know surprisingly little and less than we should Mm, 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 mm. yeah it sounds like a lot of the literature is taking it in a negative way right what are the negative connotations of pornography use does it sound like that's kind of like the direction of the literature The reason that we started the project was that we wanted to understand why it was that different academic disciplines have produced contradictory data about pornography use. And my original training was in film studies, media studies, cultural studies. And in, in those disciplines, to the extent that there is any consensus about the effects of pornography, um, it would probably be that pornography has been an important part of a feminist struggle for women's sexual agency. Mm. 
Mm. more than anything else there's kind of there's a wonderful book out recently called vibrator nation which is a history of feminist sex shops and the ways in which uh vibrators sex toys feminist pornography were an important part of helping women to discover sexual agency starting from the 1970s when Mm -hmm. part of the feminist struggle was that um, sex for women was uh, understood culturally to be something that was done to them by husbands and that they put up with in order to um, have a, 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 a breadwinner in the family and, and a Absolutely. roof over their heads. So that's kind of like maybe the cultural studies consensus would be that the pornography has played an important role in, in contributing to feminism. Whereas in the research in social psychology, for example, the consensus was that pornography has a negative effect on Mm. people and leads to violence against women. So how could you reconcile those, uh, both of those consensuses, consensi, Mm -hmm. both of them uh, are are the result of uh, properly researched, uh, refereed, methodologically appropriate academic research by intelligent researchers how is it they could be contradictory and we wanted to understand that and the answer it turns out is 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 pretty simple and that's that the different groups of academics have different ideas about what counts as sexual health Mm. and so um social psychology has and i don't think that um, the social psychologist would mind me saying this because it's quite explicit a very conservative idea of uh, sexual health which is that um the ideal is to be in a monogamous committed binary long-term relationship where you have sex in order to express your love for each other whereas in cultural studies for example one of our um most uh, revered th- uh, cultural theorist is a man called Michel Foucault who wrote about uh, the practice Absolutely. of fisting as an as as uh, 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 an act of resistance against mm. the patriarchal capitalist hege- capitalist mm-hmm. hegemony, and so when you bring those two groups of uh, academics together, the ones who are celebrating fisting and the ones who are celebrating sex in the dark with someone you've been married to for thirty years with a light uh, with them um, uh, with the woman lying passive like a starfish, it um, mm-hmm. it's not surprising that they end up with different views on what counts as a healthy sex life and what counts as uh, the role that pornography plays in that because what we can both agree on both groups is that there is a clear correlation that people who enjoy more adventurous sex are more likely to enjoy pornography but we disagree on whether or not enjoying adventurous sex is a bad thing Mm, mm. it almost makes me question the research validity right of this whole dynamic and i think it draws into bigger questions of like how do you even conduct research when you have cultural biases hypotheses that are definitely directing to a degree how we interpret the data what we consider good healthy bad otherwise i think brings up a lot of questions for me about how do we reach any sort of truth i guess what you're research was asking is what do we know given that we see the cultural influences happening in these two academic parties or how many parties we have you know yes yes i think what it makes very clear is the importance for stating our assumptions explicitly up front and that was what was surprising was that going into the archive the vast majority of the research on either side doesn't start by saying this is what we think healthy sexual life is and if we did that then it would be a lot more obvious because the cultural studies researchers might start with saying we celebrate a form of sexuality that embraces pleasure and discovery and resistance Mm -hmm. and playing with power and the social psychologist would start off by saying we celebrate a form of sexuality which is about monogamous binary couples expressing their love and Mm -hmm. then you would at least you you might be talking across each other but at least you would know that you were talking across each other exactly exactly and so it's hitting that point of research positioning right to be able to put that up front because i think people forget what a lens we come from with our different cultural scripts whatever that you know whatever that is to you of your experience the language the way you view the world your paradigms that researcher positioning is so important for how we look at data absolutely yes and that's something that became very clear in this project particularly in terms of i mean it's uh, disciplinary positioning which which links to a lot of other kinds of positioning as well I think particularly class positioning mm. the form of 
sexuality. And we draw a lot on the work of an anthropologist called Gail Rubin, who okay. wrote an article in the 1990s. 90s or was it 70s? It might actually be 70s. Um, writing about what she calls the charm circle of sexuality, okay. the forms of sexuality that are celebrated in our cultures and the forms that are denigrated. And so she's saying that we celebrate sexuality that is binary, that it's only two people, that is not done in public, that people of similar ages, uh, people who are expressing their love, where nobody is being paid for what they're doing, where there are mm -hmm. no toys being used. That is all the good stuff. And then the bad stuff is groups of people or uh, generational differences or people having sex in public. Interestingly, whether or not you are gay or straight is kind of irrelevant now. It mm. is acceptable to be a gay person so long as you're a gay person who's having sex with someone you love in a binary situation uh, mm. to, express, uh, to express your love for them and not paying for it and you're both roughly the same age, then it's fine. Mm. Uh, you can you you can be gay now and be yeah. acceptable so long as you're not ticking any of the other bad boxes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. interesting which it's frustrating because the reality is that that goes internal right i mean i'm thinking about foucault when we internalize these systems so then it prevents people from being able to see the expansiveness that is and can be sex absolutely and it's one of the things that fascinates me is how little correlation it has with empirical data or mm. lived reality so for example a lot of the research on pornography that is worried about violence against women is mm -hmm. actually talking about consensual kink and consensual bdsm and the argument is that this is something that is done to women that women are passive and men enact uh, rough sex, kinky sex, BDSM on women. But all of the data shows that women are the primary consumers of BDSM kink and mm. representations of rough sex. And the uh, Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon was merely the latest and most visible uh, recognition. There's a, a book by Kath Albury, mm -hmm. uh, an Australian feminist researcher called Yes Means Yes. Mm. And one of the things she suggests is that BDSM is, 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 is almost like the, the structuring logic of patriarchy, that women's sexuality under patriarchy is designed to be passive and acted mm. upon by men. Absolutely. And, and to take pleasure from being swept off your feet and from feebly resisting. No, no, while the man presses his hot, heavy lips against you. Um, and, and, and so that's not to say it's necessarily a good thing, but it doesn't help in understanding patriarchy and gender relations mm -hmm. to suggest that um, rough sex is something that is men do to women and women have no agency in that um, if we're going to pick it to bits, then we need to understand what's actually happening there. Absolutely, that a lot of people actually enjoy that power dynamic and can take power back through that reversal of that script that patriarchy has embedded for years for women to be passive in sex and to say that women don't have that sex drive or desire for those sorts of things. I think there's a ton of power in reverting that and getting to say, yeah, I enjoy BDSM and it is pleasurable for me. I think it's interesting that a lot of people probably wouldn't even know that correlation, right? That women are the main you know, audience of that sort of type of pornography. Yeah, yeah. There was a very interesting book book series again in the nineties called Black Lace, okay. which was like um, uh, the the sexually explicit version of Mills and Boone, and they were just every book was. Um, a wench being kidnapped by a pirate and um, mm. strapped over a strapped over a, 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 a barrel while he raped her with a candle. It was it was very much, it was written by women for women, and that was absolutely what you got when you had erotica, explicit erotica, written by women for women. And going back mm. to what you were saying before about the um, the possibilities, the potentialities, the affordances of BDSM, uh, it always surprises me that there is a coalition of radical feminists and conservative Christians 
fighting against pornography on the on, on the basis that it's a form of violence against women. And I totally understand why the conservative Christians would want to do that, because female sexuality is uh, terrifies them and mm. their God, and that is why they want to ban abortion mm-hmm. and contraception yeah, this is and, and all yeah. that. But I've never quite understood why the radical feminists are so opposed to pornography, BDSM, um, mm. and, and, and those those aspects of sexual cultures that have historically, and I'm not saying this is not a theoretical position worked out Mm -hmm. philosophically from first principles, but historically have allowed women to demonstrate and explore sexual agency because Mm -hmm. in a patriarchal culture where power relations are inbuilt, we know that BDSM has provided an experimental laboratory where people have played with that Mm -hmm. and explored that and worked on it and, and, Uh, made it explicit it goes back to what i was saying before but make your assumptions explicit and so when we're working on i I work on sex education as well and and we're Mm -hmm. looking at um, how we can usefully teach consent to young people and one of the things that i'm always banging on about is let's teach them about safe words now the idea comes from bdsm Mm -hmm. but the idea that you tell young people that consent is always provisional it doesn't mean that you say yes and then you have to go through everything your partner wants to do consent is provisional at any moment in any act of of any relationship you can stop it and there's this thing called a safe word which is brilliant because it's not just saying no partly because no can no can mean yes when you're um, playing around power games but also because no is a negative Whereas mm-hmm. if you say pineapple, that is not negative. That is just, it, it's unsexual and it takes you somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But then you also teach young people that the safe word then means that you then move into the a, a different mode of relationship, which is mm-hmm. the caring mode of the relationship, where you ask, are you okay? What happened? Uh, did it go too far? Are you just ready for a break? Do you want to try something else? Do you want me to hold you? Do you want a cup of tea? Do you want me just to leave you alone for a little while? And so you can teach them in a a non-sexual, non-high-stakes environment, how to then cope in that sexual high-stakes environment when someone needs a break and explain that that's a normal part of happy, healthy sex. That comes from BDSM, but it's applicable to everybody who might might want to have sex. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My question is, where is the porn showing this, though? This is exactly what I've been thinking about. How do I see, where do I find the narratives of this? Because I think in culture, we need narratives, portrayals, scripts, you know, character, like just things to look at as a human in our socialness to see how this plays out. And I, I've never seen a porn like that. You're absolutely right that it is it is uncommon in certainly the kind of traditional mainstream pornography that I grew mm-hmm. up with to see um moments where people stop in the middle of sex and say that is not working for me that is that is very rare and that's entirely understandable Mm. because pornography traditionally has been a genre of entertainment Mm. and um it is very rare in fast and the furious movies to see people stopping to put petrol in the car yeah and 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 that is and that is absolutely fine for what it is what's interesting now is that with digital production and distribution with the costs of entry being so lowered Mm. we're seeing a blossoming of a whole range of different kinds of pornography yeah and we're seeing feminist porn we're seeing queer porn we're seeing ethical porn we're seeing educational porn and so you can find really interesting stuff if you look for it. Mm. And so, for example, something like Crash Pad, the the porn made by Pink and White Productions, which is queer and ethical and feminist and uh, body diverse, may not necessarily include people saying, oh, I'm not enjoying that, but it does include a lot of laughter. Mm. It includes people kind of breaking off from the sex in order to laugh. Mm. So there's that kind of stepping out of it into something else. There is a website called Sex School, which is educational, like literally educational sex, sex education, but pornography. Mm. There is a website like um, Make Love Not Porn, uh, which shows uh, real life partners having sex 
Um, so there's a whole range of different kinds of pornography out there now. And that's something I think we can definitely celebrate and encourage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, thank you for those resources. Those are great places that we can like explore and have that change of our social conditioning. I think what has been interesting on my own account is to recognize how deeply that social conditioning has gone to find certain situations like that, maybe not erotic because it challenges my understanding of what the scripts are in sex and to sit with that discomfort of taking in a new medium that is showing me a completely different world. I think that can be hard to sit with. One of the, one of the things that we emphasize in our thinking about sex education, because we're, uh, we're, we're, we're very focused now on teaching consent mm. and I am so excited and delighted that that is the case, yeah. but we have to find sex positive ways to do that. Mm. Um, and too often at the moment, I worry that consent is being taught to young men and young women as something that women can withhold in order to stop men from having sex. So it's kind of, it risks being the latest tool in the anti-sex arson, uh, um, um, arsenal of, of sex education. Traditionally, sex education has been, um, we did some focus groups with uh, young people a few years ago now, five or six years ago, 14, 15 year olds, and asked them what they'd learned in sex education. And one of them actually quoted to us a line from the film Mean Girls. She said, God. in sex ed, they told us, don't have sex. If you have sex, you'll get pregnant and die. And that's still what a lot of sex education is. And the consent stuff risks becoming part of that. It's like to the young boys, you must get consent from the girls before you have sex, otherwise you're a rapist to the young girls. Do not give the young boys consent, otherwise you're a slut. Mm. So it risks falling into that. Whereas mm -hmm. we're trying to think of much more sex positive ways yeah. to think about consent. And one of the things that we're, we're hammering, hammering home is you cannot consent to what you want unless you know what it is you want. Mm -hmm. So agency is a vital part yeah. of this. And this goes back to what you're talking about, the importance of narratives and how uncomfortable we can be seeing what we haven't seen before. It can be challenging to work out what we actually enjoy. It can be challenging to work out who we actually are. And so a very simple thing that we, 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 we um, simple message that we keep trying to tell, particularly to young women is do not be ashamed of masturbating. Because masturbating is part of the way that you will work out what you like, and then you can tell your partners what you like, and then you can give genuine consent. A lot of the uh, worries, particularly coming out of America at the moment, about mm -hmm. what's called pornography addiction is actually a worry about masturbation. It's a worry mm -hmm. that people are masturbating too much. Because when people talk about porn addiction, they don't mean that you're sitting... Um, looking at pornography and writing notes about it for your next book, they mean that you're sitting watching porn and wanking to it. And there's a real worry that masturbation is somehow harmful. Sure. And um, obviously you have that with kind of like the incels and the no fat people, but it's also starting to creep into some social psychology with mm. an idea that what they call autoerotic practices are selfish and make it more difficult for you to have a genuine loving relationship with another human being, mm. all of which is nonsense nonsense yeah. and we have to speak against that as strongly as possible Absolutely. so when you're talking about stories when you're talking about how uncomfortable it can be seeing other forms of sexuality this is part of what we what we need to uh, make clear to young people is masturbate talk to people about sexuality learn about different sexualities learn about different practices watch representation see what appeals to you see what doesn't appeal to you and mm -hmm. then you're in a position to give and it's this phrase that kind of comes through a medical use, but it's, it's quite useful here, informed consent, where you're consenting to sex on the basis that you actually know what it is you enjoy. Absolutely. And that is so hard, like you're saying, if you haven't explored that, right? And it sounds like there's almost this power structure here that is saying that the better sex, the right sex is done in relationship with other people versus the solo sex experience. And I think that that is a problematic power structure there in and of itself. And it's it denies the uniqueness of the relationship that is with yourself and your own self-pleasure and your own masturbation practice that is uniquely different than a connection with another human where you have two dynamics going in. One is not better than the other, but they are so different. Or you can go to Jerichoff parties where you get the best of both worlds. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. And, and that 
also different, right? And so it, it frustrates me that we have these different, you know, whatever you want to call flavors of sexual experience. And we'll say, this is the right flavor. This is the only flavor that is okay and blocks out all, like the full diversity of our palate sexually. It's interesting. I, I, I wrote a piece for the uh, journal Archives mm -hmm. of Sexual Behavior. There was um, an article published a few years back by uh, a researcher, um, Briggs, I think it was, Ace mm -hmm. of Briggs, perhaps, where they counted pornography scenes and they came out with the figure with something like 82% of pornography was violent. Mm. And I, that didn't seem to make any sense to me because I, as part of my job, I kind of just regularly browse what's available. And I knew it's, it's, it is, it is incredibly difficult, certainly outside of the dark web to find anything non-consensual mm. in terms of, of, of pornography, incredibly difficult. And so when I went to, to their figures, it turned out that they were counting all kinds of consensual spanking, hair pulling, rough sex as violence. Mm. Um, and they actually, along with a number of radical feminists, argued that consent is irrelevant. They said that if you are being spanked, that is still violence, whether or not you consented. And what was even more bizarre was that they con contrasted that with counting what they called positive sex acts, including kissing. Hmm. And it didn't matter whether that was consensual either. That was always a positive sex act. Mm. And so by knocking out consent as the, the key, they ended up saying kissing is good, spanking is bad. Oh. And that is actually um, not uncommon in, in a, a lot of the research on pornography. Hmm. And that is deeply worrying because the idea Absolutely. that you would say consent is irrelevant in working out what is healthy sexual practice is staggering and yet people can still get published saying that in 2022. Exactly. And then the worst part is then a news article takes just one percentage of that whole study and puts it onto an article with a little bit of saying that gets shared to the whole social media platform, but no one ever takes that step to look back and say, hey, well, from this research, how did they define sex? What did they define as healthy? What did they define as these pieces? And it, it scares me the way that that can proliferate a whole series of ideas without right. checking that initial definition, yeah. that construction. Oh, yeah. it's yeah. terrifying to me. So then if consent seems to be this big piece that you want to talk, share more with the world, what is it about it that you want to share and want people to know? I would like to emphasize, first of all, that consent is at the heart of all definitions of healthy sexuality. And that point is you might think that that is too obvious to bear stating. But mm. as I'm saying, it is not too obvious to bear stating there are still people out there, um, senior, well-recognized, well-published academics uh, who argue that consent is not important. So that bears stating that consent is at the heart of healthy sexual practice. And then I would say that consent should be, as I said before, it should be pro-sex and not anti-sex. We shouldn't be teaching consent as a way to try and minimize the amount of sex that people have. Mm -hmm. We should be um, teaching consent as a way that people can navigate towards the pleasure that gives them, the, the sex that gives them pleasure and satisfaction and uh, happiness and health. Mm -hmm. And I would also say again, as, as, as we just said, that um, consent should be informed. And that means that people should, should explore and mm -hmm. by themselves and and with others and with cultural representations about what it is they actually enjoy so they can give informed consent and then finally i would say and this is uh, we have to be careful how we put this but one of the aspects of healthy sexual development is resilience mm. um, sometimes things go wrong and that need not be the end of the world um, and one has to be careful saying that because that is not to downplay the trauma that can result from particularly non-consensual sexual practice. And we must absolutely recognize the very clear line that we draw, sexual assault, sexual mm -hmm. harassment, rape, are traumatic and uh, damaging experiences. We should not trivialize them, we should not trivialize sexual assault and sexual harassment and rape by putting that in the same category as bad sex. Mm. 
And sometimes we do have bad sex and sometimes it uh, turns out not to be as enjoyable as we wanted. And sometimes halfway through, we think I'd really rather not be with this person. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, part of our journey Mm -hmm. of developing agency and understanding what it is that we like. And if you are in a situation where you find yourself find yourself in a sexual practice and you're not enjoying it if if you're with somebody who you uh, feel comfortable saying uh, I don't want to do this anymore just suck my toes instead mm-hmm. then that is great and um, if you're in a situation where you're with somebody where you go I'm sorry I'm just going to leave now then that is great or if you're in a situation where you find you find yourself going ah, oh, if I can just get through this then he'll empty the dishwasher and I can go to bed then that will be fine as well mm-hmm. yeah it's interesting I think that this topic is a little bit hard, maybe at least for me to conceptualize how you step into that space, but it's so easy to think about it in the sense of dating, right? You go on a lot of different dates with people and you can have a bad date and still learn from that by knowing what you liked or didn't like about that experience and being able to say, you know, I want to leave or explore this in a different way or something like that. And we kind of give ourselves that space to have that resiliency, exactly what you said earlier. And you can have a bad date that's traumatic and a horrible experience that can, you know, be difficult to come back from and how to integrate and step forward from. But yeah, there is this, uh, trial and error as you come into your own self i think and you decide what you know what sort of flavors taste nice to you you know what i mean and another aspect of healthy sexual development is what we call lifelong learning Mm. not only do we continue to change throughout our lives but we also continue to learn and Partly that will be discovering things about yourself that you didn't previously know, and partly it will be uh, changing into something that you were not before. And so there is never a point where it is all done. And that's one of the uh, problems, I think, with current sex education Mm. is the idea that it happens at school and then at the age of 16, that's you done. Off you go, good luck, go and have sex. Uh, Whereas, I mean, the, the obvious example is there are people who in their 40s, 50s, 60s um, come to terms with the fact or discover or understand that they are queer, where mm-hmm. that either had not been obvious to them before or had been something that they had not made peace with before. And so we will always be going through this. And certainly in our cultures, we're talking about sex is not something that we're encouraged to do. That is, as you say, it can be difficult and awkward. And I talk a lot of the time in ideals about mm. wouldn't it be great if the world were like this? And it's not. It's it's very difficult. For example, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, wouldn't it be great if young women knew what they wanted sexually and were able to give informed consent? When we talk to the 14 and 15 year old girls, uh, almost none of them would admit that they masturbated mm-hmm. because that was des- desperate, they said and mm, lesbian wow. Wow. Um, and across the genders uh, one thing we asked them how do you ask for what you want sexually across the genders it was almost unanimous the one thing you must never do is ask for it out loud because that spoils the romance so we live in this culture where i'm saying wouldn't it be great if people knew what they wanted sexually and could communicate it but we have a whole culture around People talk about sex all the time, Mm -hmm. but it is rare to find people talking about their own sexual pleasures. It's kind of, we talk about sex, but in a kind of third person way. And so, for example, it's still, it's still rare, not as rare as it used to be. It's still rare to actually hear people in the public sphere talking about their pornography consumption, real people. Uh, You'll hear fictional characters do it. And apart from that, it is usually Mm. kind of the only voices you hear are ex-porn addicts talking about how they managed to give it up. But it is still vanishingly rare to hear to hear to hear real human beings saying, yeah, I look at pornography and I enjoy it. I've I've never heard a politician say it. Exactly. Except for we have one amazing politician in Australia. Her name is Fiona Patton. Um, She was elected as, I think she was, um, it was called the sex party when it was elected, uh, when she was elected. And she was a member of the Australian Adult Industry Association. And and she's been in sex work for a long time. Mm -hmm. And she is 
a revelation and a breath of fresh air who since she got into parliament has um, she pushed through bills for um, safe zones around abortion clinics um, sex work legislation um, uh, assisted voluntary dying um, and a whole bunch of, of really exciting and interesting mm. policies, all of which are kind of linked together by um, n- not being dominated by religious thinking. But um, I think she's the only politician I've ever heard admit that uh, she has seen pornography. Yeah, absolutely. You progress as America regresses back in its levels of control. Um as I'm it's thinking, terrifying what's happening to you. It's it's so upsetting. Yes. So it's an interesting, even as you speak about that leader, I feel a sense of jealousy coming up for me that that's, that's happening in a different country. There is that level of space for a leader. Yeah. Um, but that could open up a whole interesting can of worms. I, I'm also thinking about here about how, yeah, sex is still so private in so many ways, right? There's almost this lack of, like, if you bring that up, you're not professional, right? This is like a almost avoidance of the full humanness in our professional spheres. It is interesting because one of the, one of the characteristics of modernity, huh. and you hear this from kind of the late 19th century onwards, and Foucault writes about this, is, is the fact that our cultures are characterized by constantly talking about sex and constantly talking about how we need to talk more about sex. Mm. So that's kind of, it's, there, there is endless talking about sex in the public sphere, but it is a particular way of talking. It's talking about sex as a problem. It's talking about sex as a scientific phenomenon. It's talking about sex as, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's always, it's interesting that kind of I'm old enough now. I'm in my fifties now, and I've been mm-hmm. doing this this uh, research thing for thirty years. I've been through several cycles now of young people are having too much sex, young people are not having enough sex, young mm. people are having too much sex, young people are having not enough sex, and so whatever point you are on the story, the point is always that there's something wrong with young people's sex lives, and we must talk about it. Yeah, exactly. But not actually talk about it. I think that's the frustrating piece. It's so interesting to me that, yeah, I could tell you, I like, again, I always come back to different metaphors of pleasure, right? Like, I like this ice cream. I like this. I like this taste. But the second I get into, oh, yeah, I like being spanked or I like this, it touches this whole different taboo that, yeah, Mm. it creates a different dynamic where we can no longer talk about pleasure in that open space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that digital and social media have changed the world in a whole variety of ways uh, by uh, making, lowering the barriers for entry for people to be in the public sphere. And we've seen that there's a number of ways in which that has uh, had, I think, very positive effects on sexuality. And so things like asexuality and trans has been so visible so quickly in ways that would never have been the case before. And one of those voices that I think is really interesting and really exciting is sex worker voices who are now, even 10 years ago, it would have been hard to to, to count more than uh, five fingers on one hand of the number of sex worker voices that were allowed to participate in public debates whereas now uh, particularly in the academy i'm seeing the the sex worker slash researcher hybrid identity is flourishing Mm. And, and i cannot wait to see in 10 years and 20 years how that changes the ways in which we talk about and research sex work i have a, a an amazing colleague Uh, who's the sex worker researcher um, Mm -hmm. up at the Queensland University of Technology here in Australia. Mm -hmm. Her name is Zara Stardust. And there's a couple of quite swerfy feminist sex work exclusionary radical feminists up at QUT who believe that um, all sex work is violence against women. Mm -hmm. And it is fascinating to talk to Zara about what it's like for her being in meetings So here we are, all academics together, all with our PhDs, all respected researchers sitting in meetings together. And these people can no longer just say all women involved in sex work have been tricked into it, brainwashed, exploited by men. They can't say that anymore because Zara with her PhD is sitting there going, really? Yeah. You're talking about me? 
Mm -hmm. Really? So I cannot wait to see how this plays out over the next 10 years. Absolutely, because Zara has a seat at the table of an academic discussion, which is going to change because for so long, there's been so many people at the top that have controlled that space in education and the ability to publicize all these ideas and publish different things that have changed our society and said what's right or wrong from research, right? So yeah, that's a radical thing, I think, to be changing through that power is what it is at the end of the day, right? The power to, with that education to influence society from the findings. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's also why I love having um, different sex workers on the podcast. I think to have that dynamic, to be able to hear a conversation with someone and hear about what they do in their work and what their experience is like to challenge all the narratives that we have about what a sex worker's life is, because that is such a private space for most of society. So to pull that into a public shared space, I think is radical. And I think it's life-changing to get to hear that lived experience. Absolutely. Yeah. I always like to leave a little bit of space as we come to the end of our time. If there was anything maybe that you really wanted to say here coming into it that maybe we didn't touch on in the natural dialogue and flow of our conversation. I think I have just uh, monologued about everything I care about for 45 minutes. I've, I've pretty much spent myself, but thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been an Absolutely. absolute delight. Yes. Yes. Anytime I can bounce off ideas about culture, pornography, and the way it's affecting our psyche. This is a lovely conversation for me. I do have one question to ask you. I ask everyone on the podcast, what is one thing that you wish other people knew was more normal? take your time Uh, that people knew it was normal yeah that people knew was more normal more normal than it is Uh i'll tell you one thing that i wish that people knew was less normal okay i'm always here for a change i would love people to know that uh, for the majority of women having um, an orgasm just from having a penis going into your vagina is not normal because that is one of the things that young women are not getting taught. And um, I think that, again, as I said, pornography, it's entertainment, it's fantasy. It it is not meant to be, in many cases, an instruction guide. And this is one thing where it is absolutely not an instruction guide. Get in there with your tongues, with your fingers, with your toys. Do not just stick a penis in there and expect an orgasm to happen. Absolutely. I'm like over here, like, can you say it louder for the people in the back? Because that's that's a very serious thing where people uh-huh. feel like something is wrong with their bodies because they uh-huh. can't have an orgasm from penetration. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm like, please say it one more time to be very clear. <laughs> like, that is normal. Like, do you, do you know how many, I'm sure you do know how many people seriously sit with that? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. No, it, 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 it is entirely normal not to have an orgasm from just having a penis in a vagina. Thank you. I think we could change the world with just that clip and that snippet. If we could share that with the whole world, we'd be Fabulous. a better place. Let's get that out. Let's absolutely. Get that out. Absolutely. Is there anywhere that you want to plug to your work, your research or different, you know, organizations that you're a part of? I, I will just say that uh, coming out sometime in the next few months will be the book. What do we know about the effects of pornography after 50 years of academic research? And it's a good read. We've, we've, we've written it to, it, it, um, it, it takes thousands of very detailed technical academic papers and summarizes it down into uh, a very readable, slim volume. So I highly recommend it. Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I'll have to check it out. Well, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure, truly. I have so much fun just getting to bounce off ideas and talk to another intellectual in the space. It's it's really lovely. It has been great. Thank you so much. Yeah. If you enjoyed today's episode, then leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you're a part of the Anarchist community, then follow us on Instagram or nominate a guest for the show by sending in a letter to modernanarchypodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.